Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Last time we survived a long derivation for the exact point reactor kinetics equations, but I mentioned that we don't generally use these equations in exactly this form. This form requires that we solve for the time-dependent delayed neutron fraction, reactivity, and neutron generation time, which all require solving for the perturbed flux throughout the course of our transient. Solving for this detailed, time-dependent flux behavior is very time-consuming and very difficult. So what we'll do is we'll make a series of assumptions that, in essence, assume that this flux shape doesn't change significantly over time, which allows us to greatly simplify these equations and assume that most of our kinetics parameters are constant over time. First, we'll assume that the flux shape doesn't change significantly from the original flux shape. In essence, this assumes that any changes in the power cause our flux to scale uniformly throughout the reactor core during the course of a transient. A transient with complicated localized effects, such as a BWR that might see coolant voiding in only one channel, would of course violate this assumption, but for most simple transients, this is a reasonable approximation. Next, we'll assume that the adjoint weighted fission operator doesn't change significantly over time, and that it is well represented by the initial fission source. If the flux shape doesn't change much over time, then it makes sense that the adjoint weighted fission source shouldn't change much either. This assumption has ramifications on the time-dependent neutron generation time, which again equals a constant divided by the f of t term. By assuming that the flux and adjoint weighted fission source terms don't change significantly over time, this means that our lambda also remains constant. For simplicity, our lambda variable is just represented by lambda over the course of the transient. In the same vein as the adjoint weighted fission operator, we assume that the delayed neutron fission source term remains constant. Combining this with our previous assumptions mean that we can assume that our delayed neutron fraction is constant over time and is just represented by this beta. Our last major assumption is to kick the exact perturbation equation to the curb and assume that our reactivity is well represented by the first order perturbation equation. This assumption is generally extremely accurate in criticality safety problems where we're trying to understand the impact of cross-section uncertainty, but it can break down during reactor transients where we have significant changes in the fuel or moderator temperature, the moderator density, or the reactor flux shape. With these five assumptions combined, we arrive at the common form for the point reactor kinetics equations. Since there are generally six delayed precursor groups, we generally have seven point kinetics equations to solve. But the good news is that we can solve these equations directly without having to do any detailed reactor flux mapping calculations. These equations are called the point reactor kinetics equations because they essentially treat the reactor as if it was one single point. All spatial dependence has been folded into these kinetics parameters and we only need to solve for the time-dependent power and delayed precursor concentration, or squiggle, functions. As long as our beta, lambda, and rho parameters create an accurate snapshot of our reactor, we don't really care about any spatial effects, and we essentially just model the reactor as one spatially independent point. From here, we can use one of several approaches to model our delayed neutron source, and it's worth noting that all these approaches tend to assume that our reactivity terms are constant over time. These approaches for modeling the delayed neutron source have the benefit of reducing our series of seven simultaneous differential equations to just one or two differential equations. There are two approximations that we'll discuss for dealing with the delayed neutron source. The constant delayed source approximation, the CDS approximation, and the precursor accumulation, or PA, approximation. As its name suggests, the constant delayed source approximation assumes that the source of delayed neutrons in our problem is constant throughout the duration of our transient, and that's equal to the initial steady state source of delayed neutrons from the start of the transient. This approximation works really well for rapid, high reactivity insertion transients. These transients can happen so fast that the delayed neutron population doesn't really have time to catch up. So the system's delayed neutron source doesn't really have enough time to change compared to what it was before the transient started. Because this approximation assumes that the delayed neutron source is constant, then the derivative of our precursor concentration terms 
are equal to zero. Given the steady state condition, we can solve for the delayed neutron source term, which we see is also equal to the sum of the beta i times the initial power terms for our system. From here, we can substitute in this expression for the delayed neutron source in our point kinetics equations, and then we arrive at a differential equation for the reactor's power that can simply be solved using an integrating factor. Unlike the constant delayed source approximation, the precursor accumulation approximation allows for our delayed precursor concentrations to change over time. But this change is limited to an accumulation of precursors as more delayed neutron precursors are generated by fission reactions, which is reflected in the beta power term. The rate at which delayed neutron precursors are removed, the lambda squiggle term, is assumed to be constant here, which greatly simplifies the precursor balance equations. The delayed neutron precursor concentrations can be obtained by simply integrating the precursor balance equations from here. We find that the concentration for group I is equal to beta I times the integral of the change in the power term over time plus a constant, which initial conditions require is equal to squiggle naught, which is also just equal to beta I P0 divided by lambda I given the steady state conditions that the time derivative of the precursor concentrations is equal to zero at time equals zero. From here we can develop an integral differential equation for the reactor power where the delayed neutron source is equal to beta times p0 plus lambda bar times beta times i of t which is just the integral of our delta power function. This lambda bar is equal to the average lambda for our six delayed precursor groups which from our precursor accumulation equations is equal to the beta weighted average for lambda. Finding the average delayed neutron decay constant deserves some additional discussion. Simplifying our six groups of delayed precursor balance equations can make these equations significantly easier to solve. The question is, how should we define lambda bar in a way that makes our two differential equations as accurate as our full seven equation approach? We will discuss two options for determining the group average lambda, beta weighting and inverse beta weighting. Beta weighting simply uses beta sub i for each delayed precursor group as the probability density function for determining lambda bar. Beta weighting is a nice approach for determining lambda bar because it preserves the average initial source of delayed neutrons, which is equal to the sum over some power integral times lambda i beta i, which as you can see are the main terms in our beta weighted lambda averaging function. Our second option for averaging lambda is the inverse beta weighting method. Inverse beta weighting uses the delayed precursor concentrations at time equals zero as the probability density functions for averaging lambda. Because squiggle i at time zero is equal to beta i times p zero divided by lambda i, then the squiggle weighted lambda bar is equal to the sum of beta i over the sum of beta i over lambda i, which is equal to the inverse of the beta weighted average for one over lambda. Because inverse beta weighting uses squiggle as its probability density function, it preserves the population of delayed neutron precursors, squiggle. So we have two approaches here. One preserves the initial source of delayed neutrons, while one preserves the initial population of delayed neutron precursors. Which one is more accurate? Vote now on your phones. The real answer is that it depends, and the two approaches can behave very differently. The decay constant for group 6, which is the fastest decaying group of delayed neutron precursors, is about 300 times as large as the decay constant for group 1 precursors, which is the slowest decaying group. This means that beta weighting places 300 times as much weight on the rapidly decaying delayed neutron precursor group, and that inverse beta weighting places 300 times as much weight on the slowest decaying delayed neutron precursors. So which one is more accurate? Well, it really depends on what you're trying to obtain and on what kind of transient is going on. Because beta weighting preserves the initial source of delayed neutrons, it does a much better job of predicting the delayed neutron source over time relative to a full six delayed group simulation than inverse beta weighting. On the other hand, 
because inverse beta weighting preserves the initial delayed neutron precursor concentrations, it does a better job of predicting the delayed neutron precursor concentrations over time. So which one is more accurate? It turns out that beta weighting is more accurate for fast transients and that inverse beta weighting is more accurate for slower, longer transients. Fast transients occur so rapidly that the delayed neutron precursor population doesn't really have time to change, so preserving the precursor population is not a big deal. However, fast transients take place so quickly that every neutron can matter, so preserving the actual delayed neutron source is more important. In contrast, slow transients take place over such a large time that missing a few delayed neutron emissions doesn't really make a difference. However, the delayed neutron precursor concentrations have time to adjust or to accumulate over a long transient, so it's much more important to preserve the delayed neutron precursor populations in this case. Because large reactivity insertions generally cause fast transients and small reactivity insertions generally cause slow transients, beta weighting tends to be better for high reactivity insertions and inverse beta weighting is better for small reactivity insertions. In fact, if you solve for some asymptotic lambda, which is the lambda that a transient would start following over a long enough time, and thus a representative one group value of lambda for the full six group solution, then we'll see that lambda asymptotic actually asymptotes towards the beta weighted average lambda for large reactivity insertion transients, and that it asymptotes towards the inverse beta weighting lambda for small reactivity transients. This concludes today's take on the point kinetics equations. Next time we will discuss the in-hour solutions for these equations.